Good morning. My name is Julie Malik, and I'm a proud member of the Data Research and Accountability team. I'm excited to join you today to review some accountability and testing data from the 21-22 school year. Um, before I begin looking at the data, I always like to provide some very important context. The last four years in testing and accountability is like none we've ever seen. We all know that. But I would like to frame this in the lens of testing accountability the last four years. So going back to 1819, what a lifetime ago. It was hard to believe that was four years ago, three years ago. Um, we had, didn't have any disruptions. The testing happened. Participation was great. No big issues. And therefore, our testing accountability results were somewhat normal. Flash forward to 2019-2020, truly it was a fairly normal year until March, that fateful March 13th day where everything changed. Um, at that time, we switched to remote. We did not administer any EOG EOC assessments, so we have a large gap in our data. There was graduation data, however, no testing data was available for that year. Moving forward to 2020-2021, where nothing was normal, um, students were in and out of remote and in-person testing, and the world shifted on a dime. Um, although EOG and EOC testing was back, we had lower than normal participation rates, which meant that proficiency rates were not based on all students, but merely a portion of the students. Add to everything else, the reading EOG tests were new, and historically, when we have a new test, um, proficiency rates are impacted. Finally, in 21-22, such high hopes, but everyone listening can attest last year suffered a different kind of disru disruption from the previous years. Although our participation rates were back to pre-pandemic levels, the challenges we face throughout the year cannot be ignored as the data is reviewed. So let's do a, a high view um, of what the past four years looked like. When we look at this, um, the dots represent the overall proficiency of our students. This is levels three, four, five, all the tests that were given. Notice the missing dot of June 2020, as we don't have proficiency for that metric. The gray line represents the U.S. trend of COVID cases. Notice that large spike last year. Again, it was different. It was not normal, but it was a different kind of different <laughs> than the other years. Um, so we, we felt the strain of that virus last year, as we all know. I want to point out one other thing in this graphic. That's that uh, little orange bar around June 2021. This represents the highest potential proficiency if all the kids who didn't test were proficient and the lowest possible proficiency if all the students who didn't test were not proficient. Um, this is a very important marker to know that um, comparisons to 2021 data should not be made because um, we're not actually sure where we landed on that scale. Therefore, we're going to dust off the last four years and we're going to just look at 2021, 2022 as a new benchmark. We have endured and we have complete data this year and we are proud of where we are. First, let's look at overall proficiency rates for grades three through five. We see that Wake County students outperformed North Carolina and all the categories in 21-22. This is something to be very proud of. Now, if we look at our EOC results, we see a very similar story. But don't be dissuaded by the Math 1 at grade 8 and Math 1 grades 9 through 12. Um, although those are slightly below the North Carolina average, if you look at the North Math 1 as a whole, uh, we do a achieve higher than North Carolina. The reason for that is, is we have a larger proportion of students taking NC Math 1 in middle school. Therefore, those students, um, the disproportionality exists when you look at the grade 8 and the 9 through 12, but when we look at all the Math 1 tests taken um, last year, we are still above um, the state average. Now let's look at some subgroups. When we look at this chart, I'm just going to take a, a moment to, to frame this. We did look backward for this example, and we say 1819, that's in um, orange, and the 2122 proficiency composite. These are, again, all tests, all combined. And we do notice, not unexpected, that the 1819 proficiency is a little bit higher. However, what we wanted to point out is the changes between 1819 and 2122. 
among most of the subgroups don't differ that much. So although we, um, we still have gaps in our performance, all subgroups seem to have been impacted similarly over the pandemic. The, um, the one exception to that is the economically disadvantaged who saw a slightly larger decrease. Now let's move on to growth. Um, as you all know, North Carolina uses a value-added growth model called EVOS to determine if students met growth. This model is a backward-facing calculation, which means students with similar testing histories are compared after assessments are taken to determine if they performed as well as they have in the past in comparison to each other. There are three categories students can fall into, um, groups of students can fall into, exceeding growth, meeting growth, or did not meet growth. It was reported in the 21-22 school year, 80% of Wake County public schools either exceeded or met growth. That's the largest number of schools meeting these markers since the 13-14 school year. Again, what a time to celebrate. When we look at subgroups meeting growth, uh, we consider all schools that had these subgroups. So these are the percentage of schools that had the subgroup and how they performed in the growth calculation. So for example, this chart says that of all the schools with enough students to make a students with disabilities subgroup, about 84% of those subgroups exceeded or met growth. With that context, we can see that 80% or more of the combined subgroups for every subgroup met or exceeded growth in the 21-22 school year. A special note should be noted about the English learner subgroup. Almost all the student schools who had that subgroup either met or exceeded growth for that subgroup. Very remarkable. The last data point we're going to consider is the graduation rate. I do want to say the graduation rate is still preliminary. We expect slight changes in, at the October State Board of Education meeting. So these data are still preliminary. When we first talk about the, the graduation rate, um, it's important to know this is a four-year rate, not a one-year rate. Therefore, this metric looks at how many students entered high school in 1819 and graduated four years later, or in 21-22. Considering what we talked about, about the past four years, we can, these students went through a lot through their high school experience where ne not a single year looked the same as the next. So congratulations to all those students who reached this, this landmark, this milestone. With this in mind, we have also seen a rise in non-promotion rates at the high school over these four years. That's okay. We understand some students are going to potentially need a little bit more time to reach that finish line. So although students may not have graduated in four years, we see that they may simply need another year since it is very credit-based. And finally, I think we can all acknowledge that these, four, these past four years um, introduced unique challenges to school staff and maintaining contact with students in their quest to graduate. Other priorities appeared for some students' lives, such as maybe sick family members or needing to start work a little early. Therefore, we've also seen an unfortunate decrease in dropouts during this time. All this to say that we are so proud of the ongoing efforts of counselors and staff to maintain our graduation rates. And the impacts of the pandemic may continue in this metric when you consider the next year's cohort started in 1920, so you can imagine what their four years looked like. So as you can see, our four-year graduation rate did slip slightly in 21-22. This is a trend across the state. It is not unique to Wake County. However, if you notice our five-year graduation rate, this number continues to climb, which is a tribute to those working to keep our students engaged for this important milestone. Finally, our graduation rate subgroups over the past few years. The purple line represents um, the 21-22 cohort. Again, you can see there are similar, similar changes for subgroups that we saw for all students with the English learner group saw the most fluctuation over these years. So finally, it's important to consider all contextual elements as we review the data from 21-22. We have much to celebrate. We also have much to consider as we move forward 
through a new benchmark and into years outside the pandemic. I do want to note that as a supplement to state data that is available, the Data Research and Accountability Department produces a one-page document for every school that presents data beyond just the testing and accountability data. These include survey data and teacher data. Please take a look when you have a time, and thank you for your time and attention.